Um, so look, it's 10 o'clock. So I think in the interests of time, um, we know we've got a small audience. So um, I think we might just kick off and roll through. So we just want to say thank you to Alpine um, for providing the opportunity because we know businesses are keen to understand uh, more information about the outages, um, some of the learnings, and probably give Alpine some feedback on the impact on their business if that hasn't already occurred. Um, so my role pretty much from here is to welcome Andrew from Alpine, acknowledging he obviously is unwell and now, unfortunately, has <laughs> COVID. <laughs> Seeing as you've announced it to the group, I think I'm comfortable in saying that. But Andrew, yeah. I'll hand over to you. I think what you're going to do is run through the slides. Yeah. Um, but provide an opportunity for input and engagement um, for many of the attendees. So I'll duck out of this and hand over to you, Andrew. Sweet. And um, I was thinking earlier, I was thinking, uh, given I'm feeling rather rubbish, I hope this re this session isn't being recorded, but it, um, it is. So I would just, you know, caveat um, my usual delivery with clearly I've not really had a great couple of nights of uh, sleep. And yeah, you can forgive me if I'm not as coherent as I might usually be when you've been engaging with me. Um, this is the only thing I'm doing today for work. So I thought it was better to have this conversation than not. Um, for the benefit, and I'm, I'm working in a suboptimal working situation right now as well. Um, one question, would we just be able to go around the table um, for some of the people I do know, but some people I don't. So I wonder if it'd be possible to get some introductions, given there's not too many on the call. Okay, Seb, are you comfortable if we start with you? Yep, can do. So Sebastian Burke, uh, we own Blue Lake Eatery and Bar in Tekapo and Ministry Works in Twizel, as well as a brewery in Twizel. <coughs> Stacey? Hi there, I'm Stacey. I'm Stacey Gallagher, uh, Events and Marketing Manager here at the Chamber, um, and also have a bit to do with young enterprise students in the McKenzie region. Thanks. Thanks. And Gordon? Yeah, Gordon Handy, Chair of the Chamber of Commerce. Yeah. Yeah, so we were hoping to have um, a couple of other industry reps so they might join us as we go. But the one thing that we did say, Andrew, was Simon that we Toad would... Is there, Wendy. Oh, is he? Yeah. <laughs> I can't see him. I'm so sorry. Simon, could you um, introduce yourself? Sorry, I must be on a limited screen. Oh, and Lydia, goodness me. That's hey, uh, Wendy. Uh, I... Uh... I'm not that tech savvy myself. It took a while before I even realised I was on the call. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. So I'm top of Blue Water GM, Mantra Lake Tikapo GM. Um, and look, it's Tikapo is a small place. So a few other hats, um, Tikapo school board. So yeah. Nice. Thanks. Thank you. And of course, we have Lydia as well. Kia ora, Lydia here. Um, work for Mackenzie District Council as kind of the, the tourism person um, with, alongside Jason, um, representing everyone in the sector, which is obviously um, very broad in the Mackenzie. Everyone's impacted by tourism. Um, and I guess the one thing I would say is just uh, we find, and this is probably a wee bit why we haven't got so many operators on the call, is quite a few of them are away. They take that, that dip in May as an opportunity to head offshore or, or have some downtime. So sorry for the, we haven't got too many on the call this, this time. No worries. I think the thing I was going to say is that we are recording this. So I think what we found um, frequently for business operators, uh, wherever they are across South Canterbury is obviously there's a large number of small businesses. And so to free up time is really difficult, but to have the recording available will be really useful. So um, I'll make that now to hand over to Andrew. Thank you. Nice. Um, and I think my team are just trying to get let in if someone can let them in. Anyway, I'll box on. Um, so what I've done, to, oh, and I think one of the chamber people is driving the slides. Have I got that correct? Yeah. Cool. Yes, you have. Yeah. Cool. Can go to the next slide. So the... Um, what we've done today is a slight revision of um, a set of slides we put together for Mackenzie District Council back in March. So some of the feedback from business customers went 
to Anne and Angela. So we have had that session and this is essentially a follow-up to provide another opportunity as well. Um, uh, it's more than just the transparent from last year though. I thought it was worth touching on actually a broad range of things so then we can pick and choose what's relevant. Um, super happy to in some ways skip through and go back um, again because it's online and it's public information. We don't need to necessarily dwell on it and I'm happy to tailor this session to people's interests um, and maximise people's time for the day. Um, so it might be that other topics is the more, um, and Q&A is the, the more fruitful um, part of the session. So next slide, please. So I thought, as always, it was worth touching on just where Alpine fits in to the overall value chain and supply chain of electricity. Um, even in a conversation with um, some customers recently, they still understand confusion about the role of retailers and distributors and assessing um, assessing price or price plans and, and how to switch and who does what. Um, so I've included this here just as a reminder and in some ways an opportunity for anyone to ask um, some sort of question. I realise because we're recording this that actually sometimes stops people asking the um, questions they might like to ask. So um, that could be something we do later if we stop recording um, on the Q&A, then people can ask any question and um, know that it's not getting attributed to them. Um, but the key, key point is that uh, Alpine is a distributor and we are regulated by um, we regulate a monopoly, so we're essentially a cost business, um, which can, gets relevant to some of the discussion we might have later. Um, but are there any questions on just the overall value chain and where Alpine fits in? Cool, we can go to the next slide then. So I thought it was useful to provide a little bit of context about the McKenzie region, um, which is where this presentation was originally targeted. Um, so Alpine's couple hundred people now we've merged with our field service team. So they're the, the crew on the, the first image um, in this pack. And yeah, it's quite an amazing um, landscape as we're all aware, being uh, locals here about the, um, the just the surface area we have in the South Island in a relatively low um, population density. And there's just some key stats there that the McKenzie reason region while it may not have a lot of connections the um, there are many different ways to think about how we service the network and that the part of the McKenzie region is a kind of fascinating mix of geography and tourism as we've just been um, talking to some of the people introducing themselves earlier so relatively high um, you know peak demand for the number of you know connections in terms of Alpine's overall peak uh, next slide. So one um, kind of good news story we wanted to highlight, and I, I won't go through the detailed text in this table, but it was the Twizel substation that went live in March um, this year, a couple of months ago. And that was the culmination of a relatively long project, but also a bunch of other outages or call it network maintenance that was going on, um, which did create some outages to really um, bolster the um, the network in that part of the, the region. Uh, it's, yeah, it's perhaps something to have a look at later, but if you are up, um, up in Twilight and happen to drive past, you may, that's what you're seeing. Um, and that will have quite an important uh, lift in the reliability for Twizel. Next slide. So standing back, I uh, thought it was helpful just to look at our asset management plan forecasts of um, and of peak demand and not everything is, is focused on peak demand but that's part of what drives what we do um, and I've just pulled out three slides from the planning team or three charts ref looking at um, Twizel, Tekapo and Albury. Now GXP is a great exit point that's because um, some parts of the region are um, that they're sparsely, as you well know, sparsely met by um, our connection to the transmission grid. And that's part of the reason why we've had some of the outages in Aubrey last year. Um, so what's important there is really that um, tickable uh, 
forecast just showing that there is some, we, well, we are forecasting demand to be growing and we are doing something about it. And I've just noted some of the, um, that's sort of detail, but uh, yeah, some of the plans of what will be going on, what's planned to be going on in the region. And in some ways, what we're just monitoring and not um, and not having to upgrade. So as an asset manager, there's a constant tension between investing in time for um, consumers to connect and grow, grow their business. Um, at the same time as not doing it so early that it's um, incurring costs that's unnecessary that could be delayed. So it's constant tension. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Oh, can we get, that's it. So that, those previous charts, I'll go back one, those previous charts, um, oh, can we go back a slide? <laughs> slide oh I don't have the number on me this one yep so those previous charts were kind of 10 year forecasts talking very broadly about the big picture things going on um, to meet longer term capacity needs there's a lot of work that are smaller scale projects um, and at the end, end of the day we get down to um, uh, replacing poles and, and cross arms you know, in particular regions of the network. So you've got this, this sort of real longer term capacity planning down to just network maintenance itself. So I've included on this page some of the kind of high level nearer term plans and where those, where the activity is on the network, mainly um, just to let you know what this is the kind of thing we do day in, day out. Um, it's my perspective is it's the sort of thing you you would not need to know about and if it was affecting you you would know about it um, but part of our well, we've had feedback from our surveys that um, customers are curious to know more about what we actually do and what we're doing on the network so that's one of the reasons for including some of these smaller projects um, little portfolio projects um, in this list so when you're thinking what's Alpine actually doing, then you can see for this year, for example, we've got those four projects um, going on in various parts of the region. And that's just this is just a subset for um, the region as opposed to the entire network. Cool, next slide. Right, so this is why um, we we're possibly here. So the context for um, for this is last year there was a three day, essentially three day outage, three times 12 hours. Um, I think when I've checked the controllers, that's the first or uh, the last time there was a three day outage on the network. That was maybe a decade ago, even longer. Um, that was a result of one of the reasons for it is we, the, there were not outages in previous years. So Transpower has to do the, the work. It's just a case of how it gets scheduled through time. Um, and the very clear learning was that um, shorter and more frequent is preferred to deferred. It's that first bullet point. Um, uh, yeah, it was very clear that um, our management of how well at working with transfer, but our management of communicating and helping sort of all customers and businesses work through that three day outage was um, inadequate for the it's that persistent duration that was a problem. Um, and we are, I think the bottom one's important. We are, we are developing information um, to assist customers who want to use backup generation. I mean, that, that applies day in, day out, it's not just for the upcoming outages, for the upcoming outages, so um, that's something we know would be helpful. So I might pause the, oh, and we've obviously shared some information on the, um, you know, a more detailed version of this material on the Chambers website, which I've just put a link there. But I might pause here to see if there's any um, feedback or questions specifically on the outage last year.
Okay, so, so can I throw that open specifically as well to the businesses for some feedback and commentary about that? Yeah, Andrew, Sebastian here. Our question around that is, what's, I suppose, the process or well, decision-making process around the timing of the outages? Yeah, so I've got that... Um, that's, well, you get a little um, view of that on the next slide, but essentially Transpower come to us in around February, March with their proposals for when the dates might be, when they're looking to do the work. Um, and we look at how that sits with the network um, and you'll see an example of the information provided um, on the next slide. Um, it's as simple as that. And then they sort of finalise a month or two later, and they're doing that across the whole country. So they're trying to max, manage their portfolio of maintenance across the country. And then they just sort of lock that in, <coughs> lock that in not long after, and then it, that's that's that. And that's one of the reasons we, um, we're engaging with the council, and I'd be interested to have get your views when you see the next lot of um, dates where just to go what things to, could be considered because the the outage has it so has to happen. They've got to do their work. It's just a case of when, given yeah. safety, temperature, all those considerations. But that's the overall process. They lock it in. Draft sort of March ish. I think we got the information early March, and then they um, come back to us a little later with the finals. And Andrew, um, Lydia here from Tourism. I just wonder if you know that sounds. I'm thinking ahead for future processes. If there's like a um, a business engagement circle that we could have to even socialise yep. some of those, you know, inserting that into the process so that businesses are directly engaging with you, um, and obviously with the chamber involved as well, just to have that business input into it. I think um, absolutely, yep. yeah. In the future, that's what I'd I'd love to see. Yep. So essentially, it would equate to some sort of um preference you know for all participants and it, whether it's businesses and households as well possibly if, if you believe you're comfortable speaking on behalf of households too um, that's why we went to the the council to be fair first because we were looking for a broad church of um it, we didn't have much time so the the minimum viable product was to get at least discussed with the council on like here's what's in front of us have you got any feedback um as a, as a first pass, but yeah, I agree. I think getting um, a, a broad range of customer views on what an appropriate date would be, because it's, some of these things can sit inside school holidays. Um, yeah, there's a bu bunch of different considerations. Simon, do you have any comment about that from your business perspective? Yeah, um, so would I be right to assume, Andrew, that the timing you know, the, the decision around timing was a little bit truncated. Like, you know, by the time the dates had been set down, there was probably not a lot of time left to um, look at changing dates, consultation, because it sort of felt like, you know, for us, hey, you know, we certainly understand and appreciate the work has to be done. Um, but it sort of felt like when, when we'd initially gone back, it was the sorry, too bad, so sad, but this is happening. And we went, well, look, okay, but do you understand fully the ripple yep. effect, excuse the pun, that it'll actually have on some of us in Tekapo? Yeah, and that's where, um, so I agree with you. So what had happened, so I joined, for everyone's benefit, I joined Alpine in early October. So that was when I first heard of, um, I had a similar thing of like, oh, where did that come from? Um, which rolls back to what I was saying before it was, I think because it was almost rolls back several years because the previous years had been deferred. There was, well, yeah, li so little option. There must have been still been some flex for where the th how the three days were going to happen. Um, but I just I think that is a miss on Alpine's part to have back in March of last year to not have gone. Hey, we get that we've deferred. For three years happy days for everyone now uh, if we're going to do this three-day gig how are we going to manage that um, so you are correct and it can be could be better for sure mate i'd also i'd also thank you um i'd also like to understand how um decisions that sit in behind who gets backup power are formed 
like and and again i appreciate that you know these essential services and cbd and things like schools and that that need to be powered which is cool um obviously from a and i'm just speaking from a peppers blue order standpoint yeah. um we were at a you know at a stage of occupancy where we couldn't afford not to have power generation through that period from an operational standpoint you know we've got guests coming and going on any given day, we can hold over twenty thousand dollars in stock in our restaurant. So you know we've got refrigerated food, we've got you know frozen that we've got to look after. So um, and and you know we were fortunate through our uh, own uh, power supply that we could source some generators ourselves. But it was a cost of about eleven and a half thousand. So you know it's we are a twenty to thirty thousand dollar a month uh, <coughs> consumer. So we we consume a fair bit of power. Um, but, you know, we could not have supplies. So for us, you know, it was a cost we had to absorb. But, you know, I'd just be keen to understand, you know, how the backup power is, you know, sort of distributed. Mm. Uh, I think the short answer is it's complicated. So uh, I'll explain why that um, one of the issues we have is actually the practicalities of working out where and when we can safely connect, disconnect to coordinate with the specifics of the configuration of the network. So one, you've got sort of the practicalities of people and generators and just connecting, disconnecting and coordinating that entire wraparound, call it service. Um, so there's a lot of compromises on working out what a, what a it's not necessarily cost effective, but what a um, pract practical outcome is there. Um, we did... We do have a handful of generators, but we do f uh, overall policy, and that can be changed, is to focus on those essential services um, as, a, as, as opposed to anything else. There's a um, the worth keeping in mind, essentially, if we, like I said earlier, we're a cost business, so any, um, and really up for a discussion with the communities about um, the extent to which we provide um services to specific customers that are paid for by other customers effectively because that's what it translates to so um, yeah the way you could think of it is the had we pay the eleven thousand for generation that might not have been something one option would have been we just charged you for that <laughs> um oh. or another option would have been we just spread that cost across our customer base so that's the that's essentially what we do day in day out um so, uh, but my, my understanding is that we had um there was backup generators that, that came in to, to support CBD in Tekapo. Um yep. CBO, I can't, you know, can't recall um whether there was impact to, you know, a bars and restaurants downtown. Um and I don't know if there's anyone from Tekapo Springs on the call, but they would be a far larger consumer than us. And my understanding was that they had to go into backup power for the day as well. So their cost of their yep. business would have been quite significant. Yeah. Exactly. So it's bang for the buck around that practicalities of how many, because some customers are, you've got essential services along with businesses on the same feeders. So that's fortunate um, as opposed to necessarily closing off, you know, trying to specifically select who gets what. So these, that that's, comes back to that practicalities of the network configuration at the time. So it is a, um, it's a constant judgment call where there are boundaries and, um, we just we face that each time of of doing our best to make that trade off. Yeah, I think we had um, generator power for that because of the CBD thing, but it, our biggest issue around that was the transition times, because um, the transition times were put right in the middle of prime service times. So something like I don't know three to four or something could have been like probably less less effect on people than um, than say six to seven, but. And that's an example of the practicalities, right? Because we're trying to work around the transfer outages. Providing power means kind of working inside that envelope. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew, Andrew. Rob from um, Hermitage. Good day. Uh, yeah. Look for us. Whilst we have generators, um, we we actually had that one of our generators yeah. operating for quite a long time, and and uh, it developed a fault. So. Um, you know, the, the, the period of time would be our preference is a shorter period of time. Yep. I um, appreciate those essential services uh, potentially need to get power. One of the biggest problems we had also was around comms. 
Um, we now switch over to Starlink, but um, I'm not sure if uh, um, some of the other business partners have that opportunity to do that. So, you know, if cell, tower, if cell phone towers um, are going to run out of battery, um, that's something you need to factor in. The other thing is, um, and I appreciate that it's, it's it's complex and you're having to to, to deal with uh, they having to deal with big things, but you know, can some of this work be done um, out of hours to spread you know to spread it to lessen the impact, I guess, on on a lot of operators. Yep, and that does get talked about. It has its own health and safety um, <laughs> trade offs as well. So, yep, aware of that. That. It all, we always with, ask a question. Yep. Sorry, aligned with what Rob is referencing um, from a timing perspective, the out of hours, but also the seasonality. So to try and move it out of the peak operating season. Absolutely. Um, how does that sit? Uh, yes, again, with Transpower, the idea is to get it out of the season, which is why they're in October, I think, plan for October this year, the one day. That's um, that's a busy period for for a lot of operators. October now, you know, um, yep. for, for for us, you know, this, that that has a huge impact. Yeah, I think the the catch is it has to be. Um, I I think the question is, is it would it be better in November or December or January? No, mm -hmm. that's the so the trade off is because it has to be because um, of the the climate conditions has to be acceptable for them to do the work as well. So that's one of the reasons we're waiting for it to get, I believe, to get warm enough. There's the earliest point where they can get the work done and be less disruptive from Transparent's perspective. But that could be something we um, I take away. I hope one of the team can make this note because I'm not taking notes, sorry. Um, that we can go back to them and just say, can this be done in the middle of winter? Or, um, or May. Would you? I mean, if you had your month of choice, what would it be? Would it be? It would be May, wouldn't it? May, June would be up. It's typically quite a month. So, and I guess May, in terms of the climate, is warmer than um, June, um, typically. So, <laughs> if we had if we had a choice, it would be May. If, tour, if tourism had a choice, do you have any views on um, other customer preferences on timing? Just conscious of um, home heating and things. Yeah, Ag agriculture, I guess, would be the other is the other primary sector, and I'm not sure. Raywin, what are you? What's your gut feeling? I think everyone's just a little bit different. Um, different times. I th I probably, um, obviously, it can't be in certain parts of the year because of the really cold weather, which I guess would um, be a barrier to transpower or our fine energy. But, um, yeah, I guess if there was, it, uh, I don't know, yeah, I'd like to, you know, like to that may on each side of winter, if that was at all possible, I guess. But if Alpine Energy know in March what the predicted times are, I think it's perhaps in some cases it's more about the amount of um, lead-in um, that you can give us, yep. Uh, yep. Whereas, as we know, that didn't happen in in, in November for or be fairly or twice or or two. Yeah, that's not good. October is certainly better than November, and I th or I want to also um, thank you, <coughs> Andrew, and the team for advocating for that to get it out in November. Um, mm -hmm. And I think yeah, that that piece around the notice period is critical as well. Yeah, exactly. And it's one of the reasons where I, we've shit, we've got the dates and I've just been, I've actually gone back to the team today to see if there's been any change to those <clears throat> um, those dates and we'll certainly let you know. But I've, on the next slide, uh, I've got the planned the, the planned dates that Transpower shared with us. Andrew, the day of the week's also kind of key. Um, you know, our IT team, prefer to, if we do things, to be midweek. So if something does go wrong, they've, they've got time to sort of troubleshoot um, before a weekend pops up. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, so if we jump... Oh, happy to... Are there any more 
some very useful feedback there that I think can help us help our engagement or guide our engagement with Transpan next time. Um, and in particular, when we get that set of days. Uh, yeah, this and, one here. Andrew, usually um, agriculture is reasonably quiet in May, um, except for the dairy industry. And a majority of those larger dairy farms now run their own generators and backup anyway. I would have thought that May would have been a lot better time for farming. Yeah, it'd be, uh, like I said, it'd be interesting to talk to Transpower to see what um, if there's anything guiding other maintenance schedules around the country that we can um, yeah, definitely go back to them next time. That could be quite a fun engagement. So what I've put... So, um, sorry, Andrew, the, yeah. the, the other thing is, aside from rogue snowfalls, the um, the weather seems to be more settled in May and you, you have less winds. Yep. Yeah. I think a lot of their work's inside... Um, but yes, in terms of overall impacts, I agree. So on the slide here, I've just the, the call out box on the right hand side um, is making a note that they do a, a heap of maintenance on our part on our part of their network that we don't see. Um, so I've not included a whole lot of, of planned maintenance that has no impact, but it's important to know uh, they work around that to the extent possible. Um, and at this stage, there's there's looking at, so Wednesday is the second, so we're good. We've got a midweek on that one. Um, and Thursday, the 17th of October. So they've got two, <coughs> two outages at this stage planned. Hi, Andrew. Yeah, they're still quite decent outages. I'm just, you know, obviously looking at Tekubo, but um, 7.30 in the morning till 6 at night, um, that still has the ability to provide a, a few bit of disruption to um, our business, in particular, anyone who's you know got refrigerators and freezers running. Yeah, I mean these date these dates and times are from Transpower, so I wonder if they're like a maximum window. I'm sorry, I can't hand on heart speak for them, um, and I I wonder if there might be a benefit getting one of the Transpower team to talk to how they manage their outages on the day and what they need to um, to do and manage for for your benefit, everyone's benefit, to have that clarity on why they try and get it done in a day as opposed to two shorter sessions over two days. Um, but that could be something. Yeah, look, that, as we touched on, sort of our preference would be um, a bit shorter. Look, if it was over two successive days, but it was maybe from 10 to 4, um, you know, I think, you know, many of operators would probably find that just a little bit more sustainable. Cool. So, Andrew, is that something that you can talk to Change Power about? Yes, I not sh we can. And I'll come back to you whether there's any ch ability to change these ones. And I've, I'm waiting to hear back to get confirmation about Thank um, you. these two dates as well. But we'll also see if there's any flex capability. Yeah. And I think, I mean... Even if it can't be done this year, it's factoring those um, that into That's future right. years, right? Um, exactly. Um, one thing, I, I, the second bullet point there is just um, just wanted to highlight: we do where we can take advantage of transfer outages to overlay with our own. So. It was just making a note that we do our best to minimise the sort of overall impact. Um, in this case, Transpower, we're having to replace a pylon, which needed an outage. So we um, flexed our plans. This was only a couple of months ago. Um, you know, flexed our plans to go, well, if Transpower's causing an outage for a handful of customers, then we might as well get double duty on um, an outage, a set of some maintenance work we're doing ourselves that was going to happen a couple of weeks later, I think it was, um, to get it one and done. So I think it's just highlighting where um, always is kind of the purpose of this call, really. We're always looking to make it better and getting the things we know we can do um, and then getting your feedback today is certainly going to put us in a better position for the next engagement with Transpower and certainly um, we're managing projects internally. If we go to the next slide... Cool, we can do a bit of open um, Q&A now. So there's five topics um, 
I've listed there. One is um, just talking about, we could talk about the notification process for planned out, planned and unplanned outages. Another one, um, just general contingency planning. Bunch of things on the website for um, our asset management plan. Some of those graphs I've pulled are essentially part of our asset planning. Um, the pricing area that's been in the media recently from the extensive FAQ on our website, which is a good place to go for general questions. If um, When I hear people often talking about it, I think, oh, that, there's an answer there. Um, so that's a good place to go, but also happy to talk about that today. Um, and then crucially, um, thinking back to those charts I showed earlier about um, long-term demand, uh, get, one of the reasons I'm in my role is to help build out our capability and engagement with the likes of yourselves on what your plans might be because we build and maintain the network to meet your needs. So really keen to um, just get on the radar for yourselves that if you're thinking of um, making changes in your business that increase or reduce electricity demand um, or generation, I'm very keen to be talking, um, happy to have NDAs, um, but the main thing is we want to we want to build the lowest cost network and we do that by having the best view we can of um, future demand given we're making investments that last you know somewhere between 40 and 60 years often um, that's the that's crucial for us so we are engaging quite deeply around the Timaru CBD on a lot of um, developments here to make sure we size and time the network appropriately but equally applies, as you would have seen from those chart, little simple charts earlier, to what we do up in the McKenzie country. So, yeah, really happy to have open Q&A on um, anything on that list, but also just anything. <clears throat> I'll do my best, given my throat is <laughs> sandpaper. <coughs> Andrew, perhaps I can ask you a question that was sent through to me. Um, what do you anticipate the impact of some of these large solar farms coming into the Mackenzie. What impact is that going to have? Yeah, so from a, an Alpine network perspective, very little. Um, I expect most of them will connect to Transpower's grid. Um, we do have some um, smaller scale solar farms looking to connect onto our network. And the way, you know, that works is from a so two things. One, from a power flow perspective, we do a whole lot of, of work to make sure, um, you know, there's no uh, complications for other customers and also that the, they can um, export their power to the grid into the market. But also um, probably quite important to know that the way the regulations work at the moment is those solar farms looking to connect, to connect pay fully their cost to do that. So there is no um, sort of cross subsidization or anything like that for those parties connecting. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, to the extent those McKenzie solar farms and larger scale ones are connecting into Transpower's grid, then essentially it's no different than um, any generation connection to any part of the grid. Other than there's an indirect impact, which will be temporary increase in load and employment um, for people in the region at the time. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Hi, Andrew. Um, I just have a quick question. I think it was on uh, the first slide there, yeah. um, which was you're developing information to assist customers uh, who would like to use the backup generators. So uh, when do you think that piece of work will be completed and how will that be distributed? Oh, good question. Um, I might hand to Anna, who's on the, the Michelle, who's on the call, because I know I saw her working on it just the other day. I'm thinking. Yeah. Kia ora, everyone. Good morning. Kia ora. Um, so basically what I'm working on at the moment is a list of um, businesses or providers where people can rent or even buy a generator if they wish to do so. Um, and that will be put up on the website. So I'm hoping I can do that in the next few weeks. And if you want, I can also send you an email once that's done so you can put that information out to the businesses. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much.
Other questions from anybody on the call? Um, Andrew, uh, Lydia here from Tourism. Um, just following this call, would we be able to um, get a little bit of an update around the process in terms of when we can engage maybe that business reference group and the community reference group and just make sure that it's quite formalised? Yeah. Because yeah. I, I think, I mean, thank you first and foremost for having this call today. And um, I just think it's a start of greater engagement between um, the community <clears throat> and business. So. Yeah, no, no, it's... Um... 100%. So I will I'll leave that as an action with us. I'll come back <coughs> once I've just checked with the the ops team to see what clarity they can get um, the, and to make sure we get looped in on that um, that information set. And 100% it'll be, there's two parts. One is I'll, I'll, we'll get information on the process Transpower's using and then we can work out how, the, how we, or are we, um, yeah. sort of can interface with that and what our time timing options are. Yeah, cool, awesome, and um, and then also just like a commitment to, I guess, engage as much as you can, you know, X amount of months in advance to any outage, I, I guess, so that we kind of have that understanding of, we appreciate it can't always happen, but, you know, best practice, we're, we're giving at least three months notice, I guess, to businesses. Yeah, to the, yeah, where there's flexibility for sure, um, and often there's... Um, the plan stuff, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, Seb, Simon, Rob, have you got anything to add in there? Because I know we're, we're wanting. No, I think for us, it was just mainly around the timing. Like the outages have got to happen, but it's a matter of when. And then, like I suppose for us, we're fortunate generally that we fall onto generator power, but it's that transition period over is for, for us is usually at the our peak time. Yeah. Um, and so it's like. I understand. Looking at different transition times or something. and Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's it's yeah for us it's losing all those like losing it all and i don't in, in some ways generators for us personally are well not not a great investment um because no. of the amount of load we have at peak versus what so trying to cover that would be um quite costly for um for short people, period of time all business yeah. for, to cover one day a year yeah yeah i understand yeah Yeah, uh, my comment, um, well, firstly, again, Andrew, um, thanks for taking the time. really appreciate the opportunity to have a, you know, a frank conversation um, and really appreciate the opportunity to, to sort of have some influence, hopefully, in what the future outages might look like. Um, to see uh, exactly the same for us, um, probably a shorter outage um, um, in looking at the transition times. And, and obviously with the, the, the piece of work that um, uh, was it Arnold's doing, you know, just, you know, some more information around generator hire potentially for us yeah. Um, would, would, yeah, would be really handy. Yeah. So it's, I think it's worth, um, I think Lydia and you've all picked up on this is we are looking to uh, sort of advocate for you, but by us understanding as well as we can all the different trade-offs, but what the clear, Top issues are that rise to the top we can then help the business consider all those things so thanks again for everyone just being super clear about what's important and what's not um because that's essentially what we're trying to do and what our day job is and what floats our boat is helping you all be happier <laughs> so um yeah i really Hi, appreciate all your time on the call andrew yeah. um, i mean andrew I just oh, just just the red tape for, for us even though we're self-sufficient, uh, reducing the time of an outage just minimises our, our our risks. An ironic thing was we had an unplanned outage, I think, yeah. start this month, um, and we were overhauling our generator. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, we just had to we just had to mitigate that one. But uh, yeah, short and sharp, we would prefer. Uh, Andrew, I've had a question submitted, and that's just sort of you know looking forward to new you know business development in the region is mm -hmm. the capacity for growth and new connection and reduced outages. <laughs> that sounds like utopia, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> the, uh, that's a tricky one to answer given it depends where, where customers are looking to connect. But like I, um, our, our job is to allow customers to connect. So it's a, a case of us working that out. What's important is, is getting a sense of, a, um, of when 
and how much they're going to happen um, so that we're providing the capacity ahead of time, but not and based on informed information. So the charts I showed earlier are on one of the, the slides with the capacity, you know, are at the GXP. So that's not a, um, it's a good exit point. So that's a very high level. It's not down at the street level capacity, um, but it's showing we are looking to, you know, when we're doing a network planning, we start at the top, the where regions are connecting into Transpower's grid and just progressively look down deeper and deeper to make sure we can, we're right sizing from a resilience perspective and capacity perspective for existing and new customers, that's our job. Um, and we're just doing that based on the best information we have. And we, we are looking out to 2050, so there's a lot of, you, you'll often, you won't see it, but you, but if you uh, just know that when we are, for example, replacing poles that are um, old and need replacing at the same time, we're considering how we co-optimise um, the conductors, which are the lines sizing to allow for new capacity in the future so that we're sort of, getting double duty from the the work we're doing but that's where demand our assumptions about demand and new connections are so important thank you so andrew um thank certainly thank you very much if we take a few takeaways <coughs> from here that you will formalize the engagement with business um i think we're hearing really clearly about avoiding peak operating time so the time of the year and the seasonality is really important. And I think this group is indicating May, but the May need to be a little bit more work around that. We're hearing loud and clear the time of the day, the day of the week um, is also important and that shorter outages are far preferable to longer outages and the importance of lead in time and of course, backup generators. So I mean, that's our list. I don't know if people have got any other key takeaways for Alpine from this session, but we really appreciate having this engagement and, and improving things going forward.